to be here tonight with you. And I'm working in the Department of Women Affairs and there I'm responsible for girl politics and culture. And I have the pleasure to do this event series with you, Ursula. Yeah, hi. My name is Ursula Schmidt-Palmer. I am an independent filmmaker and have been entrusted with curating this series of events. And this series of events is a cooperation with the Anne Frank Educational Center and the Kinothek Astor Nielsen in Frankfurt. Hello to you as well. And now we just want to tell you a little bit of the idea and the spirit of our event and uh, the series of events, because we already opened it in September with a concert and a reading by and with Dotschi Reinhardt in the Brotfabrik, a cultural place in Frankfurt. And so we have conceived a series of events that take place at different locations in Frankfurt. It is also an attempt to contribute to a different form of visibility and remembrance of the stories of Ronja and Sintisa together with cultural institutions in the city of Frankfurt to take responsibility and to show responsibility. The German Film Museum, the Historical Museum, the Mozartum, and today the Bildungsstätte Anne Frank as a digital space are involved. Our events build on an earlier film and discussion series that was organized by Kinothek Asta Nielsen and happened 2019 under the banner of Revision, Romnia, Bürgerrechtsbewegung und Kämpfe gegen Antiziganismus. It had been curated by Gabi Babic and myself. Thank you, Gabi. And we are very happy and proud that our event is also part of the Akidikea Festival of Romani Film in Berlin. Warm greetings to the audience online and in Movimiento Neukölln, Berlin. At Akidikea 2018, we saw the film Taikon, co-directed by Lavin Motadi for the first time and were overwhelmed. And we are very happy that after our event tonight, it is possible to stream the whole documentary um, online via the Akidikia website for two euros. You will find it online. Yeah, watch it. It's really amazing. Now, we tried with, <laughs> with our series and this event, we tried and keep trying to create solidarity alliances and networks from our Gage perspectives. Beyond fighting racist stereotypes, we want to create space for the perspectives of the artists and arti activists involved. We hope our brief selection reflects the diversity of current political and artistic positions and strategies. Yes, and the participants will show their perspectives on bodies, everyday life and politics in form of films, music, words and performances. It's all about the power of definition and self-determination. And here I see art and culture as important and central political places that make it possible to show and change social conditions, especially in times of a pandemic. We think culture and art is spaces for encounter and for mobility. And at the same time, it is important to criticize and to address systematic and structural exclusion in cultural institutions like sexism, racism, and, and all these intersectional connections, because which perspectives are represented, which are not, which stories are told and which are not. This is why for us it's so important to make a series that shows the perspective of women and queers and their artistic and political interventions and actions and their historical struggles, like we will discuss it tonight. Together, we want to reflect on current challenges in the context of social inequality, right-wing violence, as well as anti-feminist and anti-ziganist mobilization and strengthen feminist and intersectional alliances. So that's the name of the program by listening and watching. And we warmly welcome you to also join the other events. I think we will just post the flyer into the chat so that we have the possibility to be a part of that series and to find ways to connect, to listen, to watch and to learn. Yeah, and we are very happy to learn from you tonight, Radmila and Lavin, 
Mm -hmm. Well, like you will introduce them, right? Yeah. yeah. There's one last thing we have to mention, and this is in 2000, 2022. The series will lead into an exhibition by the Anne Frank Educational Center on the perspectives and of Romnia and Sintetze in Hessen. And now I'm very <laughs> pleased <laughs> to welcome our guest of today, Lavin Motadi from Sweden. Lavin is a journalist, writer, and documentary filmmaker. She is the author of The Day I Am Free, a biography on the Swedish Roma writer and activist Katarina Taikon. The book was critically acclaimed when it was released in 2012, winning four awards. She also co-directed the documentary film Taikon, which was released in 2015 and based on her book. Currently, she is a senior editor at Nature and Culture, Natur och Kultur, one of Sweden's major publishing houses. We are so very great to have you. Have, yeah. <laughs> and um, we are also happy Radmila Mladenova, who offered to moderate the talk. Before moving to Germany, Radmila Mladenova had worked for several human rights organizations in Bulgaria. Radmila is a literary and film scholar based in Heidelberg, Germany. Currently, she coordinates the Explorer Project Artistic Alternatives to the Anti-Gypsy Gaze at the Research Center on Anti-Gypsyism, RCR, at the University of Heidelberg. In January 2021, she defended her PhD thesis, The White Mask and the Gypsy Mask, in film at the Institute of Slavic Studies in Heidelberg. She also organized two international conferences, Anti-Gypsyism and Film and Visual Dimensions of Anti-Gypsyism. We are very happy to have you. So the stage is all yours. We are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. <laughs> See you, you later. Ursula, thank you, Linda, for, for the great presentation, for the invitation. Hello to everyone uh, in Berlin and Frankfurt, all over the world who are watching us also in YouTube. Hi, Lauren. Hi. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great privilege to share the space with you and to talk about Taikon. I'm also very excited, and um, I have I have prepared two beginnings of our conversation, and uh, I, I will start with that. And uh, um, so my. My my first uh, uh, my first introduction uh, is the word inspiration. Um, I I thought oh I envy all everyone who has not still not seen Taikon because I know they will experience uh, inspiration and um, there are different types of artworks some that inform some that entertain but i think that a very special kind of artworks is the one that fill you with inspiration with spirit the moment when you feel that your chest fills up with motion and you want to do something creative and uh, you also ask yourself um, is my life up to the challenges of our present time i mean this is how i experienced tycon watching the film um, and um, <clears throat> my second introduction to your work, Lauren, is uh, is this uh, great book. Um, it was published two thousand nineteen, so it's a it's still a very new one. It's the English uh, translation of of uh, your book that you published two thousand twelve, and actually. Uh, it's uh, it's not just uh, your biography of Taikon uh, called The Day I'm Free. It is three in one. So it contains the, the biography um, translated into English. It also gives uh, uh, an, uh, kind of a short overview uh, of um, the exhibition that was organized uh, 2012 about uh, the Katizzi series called um, Katizzi's Journey Through Sweden. So it was an exhibition that uh, that traveled in Sweden and was also shown in uh, in the Czech Republic and Hungary. 
And then the third part of the book, which is uh, also uh, gorgeous, is a translation of uh, the first volume of Katitsi, uh, a book that uh, Taikon wrote uh, in the span of 11 years uh, with, uh, with marvelous illustrations. And um, um, I, I really like what it's written on the back cover of the book, and I'll read it. Uh, Lauren Motari's biography brought renewed attention to Taikon's literary and activist work and created a cultural reckoning that identified Taikon, uh, one of the most important Swedish human rights fighters of the 20th century. Um, so, um, like, the English edition of the book was published 2019. 2015 came up the documentary film, Tycon, the untold story of a Roma freedom fighter. Uh, some years earlier, 2012, you, you came up with your debut uh, biography. Uh, and this is how things look when we uh, have the perspective from today looking backwards, when all this books and exhibitions and the film are already a fact. But I thought it's very important to change the perspective, and that's my first question to you, and to think of how it felt for you in that first moment when you were looking towards the future and probably you had no idea that your book will be, be such a source of inspiration for so many other people, how it was for you looking forward with this idea to write a Katarina Taikon's biography? Where did you come, how did you come up with this idea? What inspired you? And uh, how did you hold on to this inspiration? Because I think this is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Admila, for your generous, generous introduction. Um, you are so right. This has been a project over the course of some years now, more than a decade. And I want to say just how it all started for me. So my background is as a journalist. I used to work in the public Swedish radio. And so one day when I was, I had, I was out of ideas uh, I walked down to the small little library in the uh, radio building. And so my eyes came upon this book that had just been published. And it was a book about the history of Roma in Sweden. It was like a pretty short book, but very sort of like, like an introduction almost. And so on the cover of this book, there's a photograph of a woman standing in a square in Stockholm and she's surrounded by people and she has an intense, intense look in her face. And you can tell that she's trying to say something, convey something important to the audience. And so you can also see in the photo that this is a photo that's not from our time. You know, it looks 60, like from the 60s, something like that. And so on top of this, this is a brown woman in Stockholm, in Sweden. And so all my, you know, my interest immediately sparks. And I'm like, who is this person? And so I read about her. Of course, it's Katarina Taikon. She has a short, short um, chapter in this book. And I want to know more about her. So I go back to my desk. I start Googling her, you know, like, what can I read about this person? Um, to me, I think I have maybe heard the name, but she was certain she was not a person who I was like familiar with. And so when I start Googling her, I realized there's nothing written on her. And I also realized that she has an older sister because Katerina herself she passed away in the 90s. So her older sister was named Rosa. And so Rosa, I definitely knew about because she was a very, very prominent uh, artist and silversmith in Sweden. And so I uh, called Rosa Tycon and I said, 
hello, I'm this journalist, like, I'm so interested in, uh, like, your sister's work, could I interview you? And so I go to Rosa's house, she lived in northern Sweden in the beautiful, like, uh, old school, you know, that she had renovated, and that was her studio and her home. And so meeting Rosa for the first time, I realized, this is a spectacular history, and nobody has written about this. And so th this is how also the idea for the book came about. And I mean, I will tell you this, Adnila, I did not expect this to become, you know, in any way to be something that, you know, bec becoming something that the whole nation would sort of like, you know, pay interest to or open somebody's eyes, you know, on, th on that level. And I remembered a friend of mine who said, uh, you know, you're, you're one strange brown woman and you're going to write a book about another strange brown woman. And so, and we laughed so much about that because it was like, you know, a weird person is going to write a book about another weird person. But, but this, this, this says something also maybe about like, you know, the, like the atmosphere, the atmosphere in Sweden surrounding issues of uh, discrimination, issues of racism, issues of like identity and belonging. So, and, and uh, these questions I have, you know, always been interested in and, and done a lot of work around. So that's sort of how it all started. Um, well, I would say that your film is one of its kind. I was trying to think other other films that give such a detailed, such a profound uh, portraits of Roma civil rights activists. And to be honest, I can't think of a film of of that um, of that quality in terms of research, in terms of uh, understanding that it creates for the for the protagonist. And um, I think that. This has a lot to do with the research you have done, and I was I was thinking I can I can mention some names um, um, of um, like um, Roma activists who 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 deserve uh, similar films, but uh, who uh, um, uh, films that have still not been made, like Melanie Spitter or Agnes Daroci from Hungary or the English civil rights activist, Ronald Lee, or the Iranian one, Nikolai George, or the American one, Ian Hancock. And I'm saying this because I hope that in the audience, there are people with, with inspiration, with ideas, with the capacity to do something. Uh, and I think there's so many untold stories that are out there and uh, your film is really um, gives a gives a model of what it means also a good film, and uh, um, that's why I I want to ask you um, how you went about with your research. What was what was uh, what what were the principles you follow? What were the ideas that you stuck to and insisted upon when when um, writing? Uh, and creating the image of Katarina Taikon on paper. And yes. also later in film, of course. Well, what I had to start with for sure was to understand who were the close people in Katarina Taikon's life. This was my first question. And so of course, one of them was her older sister, Rosa who also herself was a public person. So she was used to this kind of question that I posed to her, which is, you know, will you um, allow me to enter this world and to write uh, like a very detailed book about your sister? Because without Rosa and also without the rest of Katarina Taikon's family, for example, her daughter, Angelica Ström, who is also part of the book and the film, Without them, it would just not be possible. And without them, I, I don't think I would have wanted to do that because I wanted to be something that they felt good about. So the first thing was like really 
mapping sort of her family and her close circle of friends and colleagues and activists. And so uh, the, 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 the first thing I started doing was interviews. And so, you know, one thing leads to another. Um, I then did a timeline about her life. I mean, over her life, she was born in the 30s and she passed in the 90s. So, you know, I was trying to sort of document all of the years, you know, she lived. And uh, Sweden is very famous for having old, uh, keeping old archives. Um, the church had a very large role in doing that. So, you know, anytime somebody's born, anytime somebody dies, you know, um, anytime somebody moves, you know, all of these records are sort of accessible in Sweden. And so that helped me also document so that I could also understand, you know, when did, when did this happen in her life? But in the case of Katrina Taikon's family, you know, up until she was 13 years old, they were um, not allowed to, to, to become um, permanent, to have like a permanent home. So she did not have an address basically, you know, before the age of 13. So also that was unusual, you know, researching somebody from Sweden because those things we usually know. Um, Another big step for me was also to research the, the time and the era because I wanted to, it was very important for me to place um, Katarina and her siblings' lives, her family's lives in the context. What kind of Sweden, you know, was she born into in 1932? And so it, in this to do this, you have to also, you know, go back and read, I guess, history. And also um, there were different kinds of laws, you know, that apply to um, Roma people, traveling people at that time. So I had to also figure out, you know, where, how did the, how did these laws come about? So the whole a historical and social and political context in the book is sort of intertwined because I find it impossible, you know, to uh, speak about the races of the time, you know, without going into exactly what kinds of policies and regulations and uh, even just like, you know, the, the climate of a place, the climate of society. I could find, I was looking a lot for a newspaper articles and, and um, how, did, how, did, how did the Swedish journalists, how did they write about Roma people of that time? It was, you know, you can find incredible things that will just give you the whole sense and feeling of, of um, of the, of the discourse, basically. So I think, you know, it was like, it was also my first book. So I, 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 I didn't know if I did right. But what I did have with me was um, methods from journalism. You know, I knew how to make interviews. I knew how to look up facts. Um, of course, I also had an editor, so we could talk about it. And, you know, he could also guide me in certain ways. So it was it was all of these layers, you know, like moving forward in a parallel way. How long did you work on the book? Um, so the, the, fir the interview that I did with Rosa after the first time we met, that became um, an article in a magazine. And that first article came out 2006. And also that's when I started thinking about the book. And then it was sort of like in my head for like three, four years. 
Uh, and then in 2010, I started like really full time working on it. So it took me basically, you know, I would say about five years. Um, but and then I had periods where I worked very slowly. And then some periods where I, uh, you know, it was full time, like 10 hours a day. I was just doing the book, you know. So you've, you've spent like 15 years of your life. Uh, like calculate, calculating. I thought, I mean, Katharina Taikon has had a really transformative effect on, on your life as well, hasn't she? That's true. I haven't thought of that, but that's true. Mm, yeah. That's true. 15 years. I was wondering, um, like in a book, you can make certain things that you cannot do in a film and the other way around. In a film, you can show things that you cannot show in a book. So we are moving towards the film. And then I want us to see this first scene that, that we have prepared for tonight. But we, before we come to this scene, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the relationship between the book and the film? They kind of complement each other. Um, how, how do you see it from the, from the writers and filmmakers perspective? Well, to me, I think the wonderful thing about the film is that we get to see Katarina Taikon speak herself. I think, you know, nothing beats that because she is so incredibly present, so incredibly, you know, thoughtful and observant. And uh, the way that she speaks, you know, her message really goes through. And I always find her to be this kind of... Um, she she's very sharp she speaks a lot with integrity but she she never you know she sort of never like gets upset with people and if you think about somebody in her situation that she has basically put on her own shoulders to uh make sure that the community she comes from will have the same equal rights as other Swedish people, which is what, which was a huge, huge uh, job that she took on because the situation was so bad. If you think of her in that situation, you know, I, I, I would think I would be just constantly angry, but she's not. And I think what the film shows is like really her brilliance in this, in this uh, regard that she is, uh, you know, she's constantly uh, striving for, you know, dialogue and she's constantly, you know, she believes in uh, the power of, um, uh, you know, like, uh, communication, I would say, in lack of, you know, but so that I think makes the film so um, special, I would say, both her, that we get to see her in action, and also that I, I think, I do think that it's clear in the book that she was so incredibly loved by the people around her, but I think more in the film. Yes, yeah, that's true. And um, I mentioned it, but uh, only in our uh, private conversations, watching the film, it's documentary, I had a feeling it's uh, like a fiction film. It has this immersive effect of a fiction film. Um, it kind of draws you into the world of uh, Katarina Taikon. And at the end, uh, you don't think, oh, I, I watched a documentary. It was like I was part of her life. I was part of her fight. I think that was that's very strong as well. But I want us to see the first scene already. I think we have to wait some 10 seconds for it's the technical time needed for this scene to be shown. And uh, I would encourage the audience to send us questions. We are curious with Lauren what questions uh, you might have uh, watching uh, this scene, listening to uh, our conversation to Lawen's uh, perspective as a as an author as a as a 
creator. De började studera på Birkagården och där gick de väl i tre år i alla fall. Och Rosa och hennes man och Björn och Katarina. Alltså de njöt av detta, de verkligen njöt av skolan. Alltså. Det är där på skolan som vi får hitta manifestet om de mänskliga rättigheterna. Och då säger Katarina men Rosa, har du sett vad det står i den här boken? Det står faktiskt att alla har rätt till bostad, har rätt till skola, utbildning, arbete. Men alla våra släktingar, kusiner, tanter och farbröder bor ju i lägergetton i Hammarby, Teppan, i Eksnubben, överallt runt Stockholm. Det här är ju inte riktigt. Är det bara du och jag som ska vara så privilegierade, säger hon. Och lite senare då börjar det här arbetet som Katarina sätter igång med. Nyheter från TT. Ett kraftfullt debattinlägg med självbiografisk bakgrund i en fråga som borde vara angelägen för oss alla gör Katarina Taikon med en bok som kom mitt i bokhandeln idag. Den heter Sigeniska. Jag vill att människor ska se logiskt och tänka klart och det är inga märkvärdigheter jag säger i min bok. Skolgång. Bostäder, en möjlighet till att arbeta. Vi ska ha precis samma möjligheter som alla andra svenska medborgare har. Den här boken Sigeniska är lite grann en blandning av medborgarrättsbibel, memoarer och kåserier och livsöden. Men det var en bok som verkligen slog igenom på ett ganska makalöst sätt. I really like the moment with the lights. When we see how the lights are being turned on in this dark Stockholm. It's very nice detail. Mm. Um, I also thought that um, um, again we have a book that that has a transformative effect, and this is Katarina Taikon's autobiography or um, a collection of, of texts compiled as autobiography called Gypsy Woman. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that book? Because uh, we cannot read it in Swedish and it's not part here. So it would be interesting to know what, uh, what, uh, what's, uh, what's the story of the book, what is to be found inside the book and, and uh, what it means also to have this book written in Swedish. Yes, absolutely. So the book came out in 1963. It is Katarina Taikon's first book. And uh, with this book, you know, she becomes sort of like almost like a superstar overnight. This is being reviewed everywhere. She's being interviewed in TV, in, at the radio. So this is a lot, you know, this is a major event in Sweden. And so 
the book in itself, it's sort of like a mix between um, autobiography, you know, she speaks about her family, where they come from, um, the, the in the, sort of also in general, just giving, you know, some kind of brief overview about, you know, who are the Roma people, what is Roma culture, you know, what is like, what are traditions that are important to us, you know, things like that. And so the the second part of it is, you know, looks at the social situation of that time. And this is a way for her to, um, it's a way for her to really introduce this question as a, as a, as a political question, you know, this is like, she's, she's framing this in a political way. And I think that's, that's, you know, that is one of the biggest um, challenges that she has, because in this time, in the early 60s, the, the, you know, institutional racism, and also the sort of like, you know, everyday racism that just like, is just present in people's life, it is very, very socially acceptable. There, there, there's there's sort of no problem about it, you know? There's no problem that Roma people um, will not access housing or education, or that, you know, you can speak about Roma people in a certain way. It's, it's, it's just part of the ever, you know, the, 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 the ordinary life. And so when she comes and she looks at this and says, this is, uh, this is oppression. This is, um, we are being held out, you know, from our basic human rights. This, this is, it's why it becomes so huge because it just makes people look at this with completely new eyes. So that's, that, 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 that is what the book does. And so after, you know, when the book comes out, she starts like traveling all around Sweden, you know, showing up at like small towns, big towns, like community centers, libraries. And so this is a way for her also, you know, to use that as a platform to go out there as an educator. Maybe. Um... I mean, we, we are into the story of Tycon, both of us, but I, I just thought um, there are certainly people in the audience who don't know anything about her. So maybe it's good if you um, also uh, give like the, uh, the frame of, of, of her biography so that um, one can understand where she comes from. Yes, absolutely. So... Katarina Taikon, um, she was part of a family of four siblings. Her father was, they had come um, b- before Sweden, they had lived in Russia uh, for many years. So they considered themselves Russian Roma. Uh, so her father was Roma and they immigrated to Sweden in the end of the um, 19th century or somewhere beginning of 20th century, uh, together with, um, the story goes, together with like six other Roma families. And so in Sweden, that uh, group of people who immigrated at that particular time, we call them the Swedish Roma in today's, yeah, it's kind of funny because it's like, you know, but so in, in Sweden, uh, different parts of the different of, of Roma communities are being defined, you know, according to when they immigrated. So, you know, you have the Roma who emigrated 500 years ago, and then Katarina's fa- family, that's like now 120 years ago. And then it's, uh, you know, the Roma from, say, Poland uh, in the 70s. And so, this is like how the different, you know, communities are being spoken of in Sweden. But so Katerina's father was Roma uh, from Russia and her mother was non-Roma. 
And so they met in the city of Gothenburg in the 20s. Uh, and they, they had worked in the same restaurant. And her father, they were Keldarash. And her father was uh, famous for being a musician. He was uh, also uh, a coppersmith, a silversmith, and also... Your mic is off. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah. it's, sorry, it, I was also going to add, it's also said in the Roma community that he was the first uh, Roma person in Sweden who started to, um, what do you say, like amusement park, you know, like uh, we say Tivoli. Is this word mm -hmm. translates? Yeah. Um, but amusement park, I think everyone understands. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. so... <clears throat> And so, so then Katarina, she is the fourth child in that family. And um, during her childhood, the m common policy was to not let Roma people settle. So even though, you know, a part of the year they wanted to travel for work, especially the summer periods, even though they wanted to settle, even though they wanted to have a house somewhere, you know, they could not. So this was one of the big issues for Katarina and for her family and for the whole Roma community in Sweden at, the, at, at that time, especially, you know, this community that they belong to. And this also led to um, the fact that the children couldn't, be you know uh, they couldn't go to school because they didn't have any addresses so it's just led to so many kind of different you know problems for so many Roma people and Katarina has written all about the, this extensively in her books so um I was wondering I, I don't know uh, when she went for the first time to school and and how her education developed but I wonder how how in your why or how in your opinion she developed as such a uh, influential uh, writer I mean to write a book and to have it in all newspapers reviewed is an achievement um, how how does she how does she manage that what did she do what 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 was it that that brought her to this position? Um, yeah, I mean, so you're right about her schooling. She did not go to school a lot as a child. I think, you know, she went maybe one full year, like maximum one and a half. Um, she then was married off when she was 14 years old. That didn't turn out great. You know, she ran away from that. And so one thing led to another, but, you know, when her both, when she was then 16 years old and both her parents had passed, she then, you know, starts living a life and starts working. And the next time she goes back to school is when she's 26 years old. And so both her and Rosa, uh, her older sister, uh, chooses this school. They go there for two years. And Rosa is, the, by then, Rosa is 32 years old. And so Rosa knows exactly when she, what she wants to do. She wants to become an artist, a silversmith, and she applies to the art college in Stockholm, and she is accepted. But Katarina, she's not sure what she wants to do. There are some interviews with her before she becomes this kind of like really this public figure, she says to one of the journalists that maybe she wants to become a social worker because she said, I want to help um, my people to get out of this difficult situation. And, and so <laughs> it turns then out, she does this kind of combination of being, you know, a writer, an activist and social worker. And so to, to come to your question, like how 
did she manage to write this book? Because it, it is truly a great book, you know? Uh, I think that it's a combination of thing, things. I think definitely one of the largest things is like, you know, just her own creativity and her own mind that she she's she's a she's a thinker she's an intellectual person you know even though she has missed out so much on um school on studying she really craves for knowledge and i i think this was in her spirit i think another part of it is that she had people around her that encouraged her to write that said like you know you have something special to tell um i think also i think both like you know in terms of like people around her in her network but also in her intimate sphere she was very encouraged by her uh, husband her longtime partner his name was bjorn and so bjorn was also you know he said she i, I think they discuss these issues you know so much and and try to always you know work around these things together so I think also Bjorn gave her the courage to really take this seriously and to sort of you know do her thing which is really approaching this in a very critical political way Um, well, um, I, uh, I, li I, I like very much your explanation because I think that uh, it is the gaze of the other that makes you. And like, we wouldn't have been here if you hadn't seen Katarina Taikon the way you have seen her. And she couldn't have uh, developed the way she developed if it wasn't for the people around her who loved her and who saw her. I think it's uh, yeah. it's something that uh, yeah you discover again and again that uh, we create each other and it's uh, everyone is responsible of how you look at other people and uh, how you create them with the with the way you you look at them. Yes. I I would suggest that we we see the next scene. The time is running really quick. We have <laughs> we have uh, not that many film uh, scenes. Um, but they are also good, so I wouldn't like that we don't show them now that they are prepared. Inte 65. Då hade Katarina lyckats med konstdycket att för första gången vi svenska romer skulle få gå i ett första maj tåg för vår egen sak. Det var en fantastisk upplevelse att när vi gick då längs mot gärdet från Humlegården så hoppade folk spontant in i vårt tåg för att visa sin solidaritet och medkänsla. Just den där demonstrationen var så slående alltså att det fortfarande var sån orättvisa i Sverige att man måste demonstrera för att få gå i skolan. Det eh, mest konkreta så att säga, kamporganet eh, var då senarsamfundet. Och det hade en väldigt viktig eh, funktion i att eh, skapa de första skolan. Vad står det där? Kan du läsa högst? Ja. Så. Så. Vi var en liten armé av kämpare. Ibland gick vi framåt, ibland fick vi retirera bakåt. Finns det väl alla anledningar att fortsätta den här formen av undervisning som de här eleverna begär? Ja, det finns starka skäl för det. Men å andra sidan så är det ju vissa tekniska svårigheter. Det ska skaffas lärare. 
det är kostnader och det är lite. Ja, då kan jag tala om för statsministern att lärare har redan ringt och anmält sig och det finns möjligheter att få fram lärare. Och vad kostnaden beträffar så är det ju i varje fall en nioårig grundskola som har gått förlorad och det här rör sig om två års utbildning. Ja, det är onekligen argument som, som talar för kursens fortsättande. Vi ska pröva även de argumenten. Då kan vi hoppas kanske på en ljus framtid. Ja, det ja, Vi ska pröva ärendet nu. Jag hopp, hoppas kan man ju alltid. Då gör vi det. Um, well, I think here we will need your you to 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 give us the context. Uh, Absolutely, I'm, I'm... and I like this excerpt because she's interviewing the Prime Minister of Sweden, and so you know this is 1964, uh, 1965, and so. The main issue that Katarina Taikon and the other activists around her, the, the main issue that they combated first was the issue of housing because it was really bad. You know, people were living, some people were living in tents, some people were living in uh, small vans. And so that was just the urgent issue. But so when they started seeing that, you know, that kind of work gave effect people actually got houses so that the second issue for them to address was the issue of education and so not only the children um, the roma children in sweden at that time not only were they excluded from the school system because they were excluded you know they had lived in uh, camps or as rosa tycon would say in ghettos And so you couldn't put your child in a school, you know, these camps were far outside of the city, there was no uh, transport uh, or communication. And so the children was definitely excluded, but also the adult Roma in Sweden at that time, uh, they thought maybe something around 80% couldn't write and read. And so this is Katarina Taikon's attempt to start education uh, programs for adults. And as you could see in that uh, clip, there was uh, sort of like a small committee that went to the prime minister. And, you know, they had, of course, lobbied for a really long time to get an appointment with him. And so some of the people in that committee were the first students of the adult education. Um, that they sort of tried out as an experiment during the summer of 1964. And so when they saw that that was a success, they started edu education programs for adult people in I think six or seven uh, cities all around Sweden. And why I think It's so great and also so funny with the, her meeting the prime minister is that, you know, she has clearly taken the role of the journalist. So she, you know, she must have agreed with the TV journalist that, yes, okay, I'll do the interview. And she knows, of course, exactly what she's talking about. You know, she has all the facts there. And so... I just love the way that she's trying to be polite and say like, you know, there are no reasons for you or the government to deny this. So both it's a very important sort of like political uh, action, but it's also, if you also think about uh, Katarina Taikon, you know, she just a year ago, uh, you know, became, a name in the public debate, you know? So she, she really quickly, um, quickly, you know, took these steps to um, really place herself in, in this debate. And I think she was also 
I mean, today maybe you would call her like a brilliant PR strategist or something, but I think she was good at that. Um, we have one, uh, one question from Berlin, our first question. And it is, um, why was the policy to not allow Roma settle applied in Sweden? And how, how this affected the Roma across the country? Uh, the question was why? Yeah. Well, this, this goes back uh, a few decades. So there was, a, there was sort of like a big shift in the, in the 40s, I would say. Before the 40s, there was reasons for Roma people to travel during a certain you know, period of the year because their, their skills and their jobs and their income was dependent on them traveling and working in different places, you know, arriving in a new town and offering your services basically. So the, the kind of jobs that they could offer at that time, it was things that people needed so in terms of like, you know, commercial work was the uh, amusement park or say the coppersmith work because um, the pots and the pans that we used to cook in, they were made from copper. And so you needed somebody who could, you know, treat these things so that the copper didn't contaminate the food. Um, so these kinds of work that a lot of Roma people had and this kind of skill set that they have, they, it was asked for and, and required, you know, it really gave them an income. But so in the 40s, you know, this shift began where the aluminum came and replaced the copper so that anybody who had, you know, worked with copper was no longer really it, it wasn't like really asked for or going so well. Also the amusement parks really like as, as like something to fun to do, you know, with kids or with family really started going down. There were other things that people, you know, rather did. So when the Roma community in Sweden realized that there were no longer any reason for them to travel, you know, they understood, okay, then we have to become like permanent, basically like permanent settle. And this is then when the problem starts because Sweden throughout the whole 20th century have a discriminatory policy that Roma people can only stay in one place for three weeks. And so you ask why? Well, the, the it's, it's because of racism. So this discriminatory policy was still in use when so many Rome people wanted to settle in the big cities, in Stockholm, in Malmö, in Gothenburg. And so when, when the different uh, you know, cities, the municipalities, they didn't want to accept this, then they created these camps, which were far out, you know, outside of town. They were mo mostly, you know, in the forest. You couldn't easily get into town. You could, it, unless you had a car, you couldn't basically, you know, have a, a, a job to go to in a easy way. So this is the, this is why we had the camps and you could, you might say, oh, okay, but you know, there are, these kinds of settlements, these kinds of camps like throughout Europe for Roma people. One big issue with Sweden at that time or one condition was that Sweden at this time is one of the, you know, has undergone a huge transformation. You know, we went from being really poor agricultural society to becoming one of the more most like modern, you know, um, egalitarian societies in the world. If you say the word Sweden, people think of good stuff, you know, they think of healthcare, they think of like the welfare system of like gender equality, all of these things. And so in the 60s, 
when this was really the self-image of Swedish people and the Swedish Sweden as a nation, at the same time, you had this discriminatory policy going on. And so this was a clash, you know? And so like politicians, they couldn't, they couldn't defend this, this contradiction because of course, Roma people were Swedes. They were they had been there for a long time, and they were even Swedish citizens. They had passports, you know. So this this was the reason to why uh, you know the whole situation become became like that. So I was thinking, if you if you can summarize the change that Tycon affected what would you say i mean what did she manage to do politically how so, did she manage to change um swedish society so i would say there were three parts so one is uh empty the camps uh she got everybody housing uh she made sure that those sort of like that change of policy were um, given to everybody. The second was the whole issue of education where she and this network of activists she worked with, they uh, made the politi- they had uh, made the politicians uh, start education uh, programs for the adult people, the adult Roma. And I think number three, is that she, through her, you know, her talks and her um, books and her articles and her voice just in the, you know, public discourse, I think that she made people understand that, you know, there is something here in this in Swedish society that's called racism and, and and she brought this into the context of Sweden because Swedish people lived you know according to this idea that racism always exists somewhere else in South Africa with the apartheid regime in the United States in the southern states of course and a lot of you know progressive um, young people in Sweden, they were really engaged in in different anti-racist or anti-colonial movements, but they didn't think of Sweden as a place where this also happens. So Katarina really made people confront the problems that we had in Sweden. I think, thank you. Uh, that was that was a good summary of a life's achievement. <laughs> I think we can we can move to the next scene. Um, I suggest we we watch uh, the scene about um, Katarina and I think Rosa, both of them taking part in a film. Yeah. Det fanns ett konditori som bakade de godaste bakelserna du kan tänka dig i Stockholm. Katalina och jag gick ofta dit när vi träffades. Och så sitter vi en dag på konditoriet och så säger Katarina. Suxdorf. Arne Suxdorf. Katarina skulle kunna få vara med i en film som han hade tänkt att göra om romerna. Det 
Och då har de genom Arne Suxor film få reda på att det finns det två flickor, Taikon, som ska få vara med i filmen Smede på lussen. Nästan så gå va? Hopp, 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 med oss. Så mot oss, jag har länt här. Här är lika tromat här. Taik, taik. Ja, tack. Åh, oh, oh, varsågod och hopp, 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 hopp. Vi pratade ju då som jag pratar nu. Svenska. Är det här i den vagnen? Nej. Och då säger han som gjorde filmen. Nej, nej, flickor. Vi måste prata lite annorlunda. Vad då annorlunda? Ska vi prata ett annat språk? Ska vi prata på romanet? Nej, nej, men ni ska inte artikulera er så där väldigt väl. Ja, men det är ju vårt sätt att prata. Ja, men då blir det inte trovärdigt. Sorry, we have we have one more question, but before we move to that, I I just thought this is such a such a rare moment where um, scenes from a film are confronted to the people who are forced to perform in a in a kind of in a stereotypical role. role. I, I think this is such a it makes you feel ashamed somehow watching this and hearing how a woman who is such an accomplished writer was forced to play a role of someone speaking that Swedish. Um, how, how do the girls sound in the film and, and how did you feel about that? I mean, it's, I don't know, I just thought this is, it shows so much the contrast between um, who the people are and how they are perceived and how they are perceived with the gaze of the camera, which has much more power than just the individual. Yes, so I did not know about this film, you know, Rosa was the one who told me about this. So the first time I went into the archive and I watched this, like, I was shocked because I thought, oh, you know, the, the, the kind of like production of these images of, you know, really the other if we could use that word you know it's it's being done exactly you know in this moment right here because what happens in that scene is that you know when they step in onto that uh carriage they they don't speak the usual swedish that they speak you know you would say they speak broken swedish so it's they even say something incorrect and so here rosa really just says you know they they think that that's us and i, I to me I, I, you know i really we we talked about this a lot because also in a when we discussed this thing with the films because you know, they had been in this first film and then one thing led to another. They did these small parts in different films in different places. And so she told me that uh, they went to see another film that they had both been in. And they had invited also some of the older Roma people, you know, and, and then so this older lady had said to Rosa, oh, okay, like now we're here now we're sitting you know we're gonna watch this uh new film uh let's see what they're gonna like make up about about us now and i just thought you know so this is like them going to the movies you know in the beginning of the 50s and there there is absolutely a clear understanding that there are being stereotypes produce about them and this is just basic knowledge you know if you're a Roma person even in the 50s so just 
to give you a little context. Um, I, uh, I I read uh, uh, an angry letter of um, an American filmmaker somewhere, I think from the 20s. And again, he was complaining that people want stereotypes or familiar images. So he's allowed to show Roma only in a certain way. And if if they live in a different way, much more modern, it's a no longer acceptable image. I mean, it comes from even earlier. And uh, amazing. I, I was I was talking to Roma actresses uh, recently, one from Bulgaria, Natalia Tsekova, and one from Portugal, Maria Gil. And uh, both of them are open about their background and they say that they are Romani. And um, the interesting thing is then that uh, you, be, be, uh, you get only roles then as a Romani. You, you can't play anything else but your ethnicity, which I think is still uh, such a sort of, of blindness. Uh, and um, Natalia Tsekova, the Bulgarian actress, was saying that she often has to refuse roles because she's given roles of, of a, say, of a mother who is selling her children or, or who is trading with children. And uh, she says, uh, what kind of message is this film uh, 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 disseminating and I don't want to be part of it. Who who is it enriching? For whom? Who does it do benefit to? Nobody. Mm. Uh, but um, just just to highlight uh, how much uh, film uh, has contributed to to this. Uh, uh, I don't know how to to call it. This kind of um, yeah dehumanization. This 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 form of of. Uh, um blindness uh, ir ignorant blindness that that then um um breeds violence and and breeds poverty and and um nothing good uh but um we have one more question here uh which brings us back to the issue of politics uh, it's uh, 50 years uh, since the first World Romani Congress in 1971 this year, said the question. How much do you think Katerina influenced that as a civil rights leader? Uh, and, and then the question continues, do you think that Sweden needs more people like Katerina Taikon? Or do you think Sweden learned from her and there are no other issues in, uh, in there who need... Um, to change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, in the research that I have been doing, I haven't seen, uh, you know, signs of like correspondence with uh, activists outside of Sweden, for example. Uh, that hasn't been so clear to my knowledge, but I do know that Katrina Taikon in, maybe it was in 1970, 1971, she did sort of like a trip in Europe uh, with two, three other friends who were also activists and they went to some countries to meet with both like, you know, community organizers, activists and, people on some kind of political level so uh, this is something that still maybe needs to be looked into you know what was her relationship to um, people in other places and especially uh, in the 1971 um, conference so that's a great question and the second one about do we need Katrina Taikon today? I do think we need. Um, I think it's very hard for somebody if they would like to, you know, take that role because, uh, you know, Katrina was really so, such a special character, but the kind of organizing that she did and also the kind of like sort of uh, educational approach that she had to, to things, I think definitely. Um, I think also, you know, 
the, during her time, there were, for example, really no laws against discrimination. You could go into a restaurant and they could kick you out and there was no law to protect you. So, I mean, I think also, I think that would be, she, she, she definitely brought that up uh, in her time. And she was very early on uh, these issues. But I think for today, you know, for example, those things could be much, much harder pushed than they are today. And I, I, I would think, you know, in general, thinking about how um, the, the equality issues in Sweden, you know, according to um, ethnic background, racial background, all of these things are, are definitely things that we're struggling with. Um, well, maybe I can add something here. Like watching the film, I thought that, um, for example, the protests against um, Abschiebung in German, um, uh, relocation of Roma to their original countries that they were protesting, like they were fighting for this French family to stay in uh, Sweden with these cute kids that uh, got this special help. Uh, I really like this part of the film. And I thought it's not very different from, from today. And uh, I also thought that uh, um, we still even have today this image of Sweden of being a, a, a paradise on earth, like a country where uh, many aspects of human life are taken care of. But I had a very um, uh, kind of upsetting experience last summer in Stockholm. Um, I was visiting friends there and uh, through them I could learn that um, um, Roma from Bulgaria, maybe also from Romania, were um, kind of um, shipped to Sweden as workers. Uh, and they had to collect um, uh, these blueberries somewhere in the forest. Mm. And the person who, who hired those people was actually banned from doing business because he, he was... Uh, acquitted of being uh, of, of having like back, bad practices so he he took those people somewhere in the forest far away they uh, weren't paid but they had to work and after a while one of them apparently couldn't stand the the situation was probably a bit more emotional and 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 uh, and so he turned up in front of a bulgarian embassy and uh, he had no money, he had nowhere to go. So the Bulgarian ambassador paid with his own money his plane to Bulgaria so he could go back to his family. And, uh, and usually what happens with these people who are lied to, they end up in, uh, in the social services in Sweden who take care of, of them for a while and then they got shipped back to Bulgaria. And these are cases that are not investigated and uh, and that also kind of are like a stain on, say, Bulgarians or Romanians, and also a burden that, like a financial burden, they have to take care of. And uh, I thought, I can't believe, I, I really can't believe that such things are happening. Yes, yes, this is absolutely true, and this has been going on for many years. So you know they. Uh, kind of uh, have people come here and think that there's a good agreement and they're going to get paid, you know, in a like proper way and things. But there are terrible, terrible stories from the people who really take these jobs and think that this might be a good, you know, uh, job situation for them. And this is so true. You know, this is going on in Sweden today. Um there are things that are absolutely, you know, unregulated and also, as you said, not even prioritized to be looked into. Yeah. So yeah. this is, it's, this is a real issue. Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, um, let's, uh, change a little bit the topic. Um, we were, we were talking that, uh, uh, Rosa Taikon, 
uh, is celebrated in, a, in an exhibition of her silver work. Uh, that you, you also wrote an article for the catalog. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this exhibition. Um, I don't think we'll be able to visit it. So it will be good to hear what's happening right now. Uh, in uh, It's not in Stockholm, was it? In exactly. It's not in Stockholm. It's yeah. uh, in a town three hours from Stockholm. Uh, to the north. And so, you know, Rosa, she passed away um, four years ago and she lived to become 91. And she was active really to, to the re like end, end. And I think a reason she, you know, lived that long was also that she really loved her work. She during her lifetime, she was absolutely, you know, celebrated for her work as a silversmith, as an artist. And so when she passed away, her studio, her workshop was donated to this museum in this Swedish town. The town is called Hudiksvall. Nobody will remember this, but anyway. So the museum there, they, they wanted to... Um, have her workshop and they installed it as a, a permanent exhibition and so right now uh, there's a sort of like a retrospective of her work uh, you can see you know her silver work she did uh, all kinds of beautiful things and this is up I think for some maybe some more months and um I think, you know, when I listen to the other people who really have looked into Rosa's work, you know, through maybe sort of like an artistic perspective, they always say that uh, the work that Rosa did was really never looked upon in like aesthetic terms. It was always kind of like, oh, you know, she had Roma background and so... Uh, she did this work um, and she modernized, you know, the kind of like the Roma tradition sort of uh, say. But I, I think that now there's a younger generation who wants to also look at Rosa's work with new eyes and also see her as some kind of like, you know, really like a modernist uh, pioneer for you know, the stuff that she did. And also, I just want to say that whenever you met Rosa, she never really talked about her work as an artist. She always wanted to talk about, you know, what's going on in the world, what's going on in society. She she was really like, you know, engaged and she was always wanted to, you know, be in conversation with younger people and stuff. So sometimes you forget that she was this really prominent artist. Um, but I, 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 I don't think, you know, the people who appreciate her work has forgotten because it's very extraordinary work. She's so great on the camera. I find it's, it's so nice to listen to her, even though I don't understand Swedish and, uh, to look at her and, uh, and um, she looks like a great story storyteller. And mm. I have a little bit the suspicion that it's also through your work that her work is evaluated in a new light. Well, I mean, I wouldn't dare to say that. That is so nice of you. But, you know, I think what needed to be happened was that, you know, a lot of different people from a new generation would really look at both of these sisters' uh, work and their contribution because, you know, for many years, Rosa in Sweden, even though she's this, I mean, as you say, like, you know, just by looking at her, you can tell that she is so interesting, so alive and so intelligent, you know, she was looked upon for, for some years as like, yeah, she's a little bit too much, you know, this like older crazy lady because she was so persistent 
in you know these issues and like talking about really the racism in Sweden that Swedish people they just don't they don't want to acknowledge so i think it's i think it's time that you know we start seeing them for all the amazing groundbreaking work that they did and and they really changed so much in sweden um we also wanted to show one scene where Katarina Taikon is reading from Katitsi, the children book series, which she um, was working on for more than 10 years. It's uh, 13 volumes. I think it was translated twice in uh, Germany. There's this uh, German um, teacher and scholar Ute Wolters who wrote on the reception of Katitsi in, uh, in Germany and who also translated the first version of Taikon the film so we could show it. We showed it 2017 in Berlin. I think it was one of the first screenings of the film. Um, I'm speaking quick because we have another few minutes. Oh, here comes the scene. Okay. Majen, Majen ropade Kalle triumferande, det är en lus på min bänk. Magister Engdahl slog pekpinnen i Elsas bänk så att en bit flög av och hamnade i bojans knä. Jag tolererar inga busfasoner, är det uppfattat? Ta om det där från början. Magister Engdahl, jag sa bara att det är en lus på min bänk. Vad säger du, har du lös? Nej, inte jag. Hon sa Kalle och pekade. Alla vände sig om och stirrade på Katitsi. Magister Engdahl fick en rynka mellan ögonbrynen och gick fram till Katitsi. Han drog henne upp ur bänken, grep tag i hennes hår och synade henne noga. Jaha, det stämmer. Se genare i skolan. Lös på alla kanter. Det gjorde ont när Magister Engdahl drog Katitsi i håret. Ilskan sköd i henne och rasande bet hon honom i handen. Aj, vad tar du det till med sig unge? Vet du inte hur? Läraren slog Katitsi hårt i ansiktet. Katitsi log föraktfullt så spottade hon på honom. Katitsi såg allt sammans framför sig. Hon hade inga möjligheter här i skolan. Här skulle hon aldrig lära sig läsa och skriva. Katitsi gick fram till läraren, satte händerna i sidorna och såg honom stint i ögonen. Ballå! Svin! sa hon och vände på klacken och gick med rak rygg ut genom klassrummet. I'm very curious how this sounds in Swedish because... Uh... It's so important what language you use. I think it's not easy to reach children language. It's not just the story, it's the language itself. And um, uh, she had enormous success uh, for years. Um, yes, so you're absolutely right. The Katitsi series, which is you know based on her life from six year olds to 15, they were extremely popular in Sweden. They became, you know, part of main culture, part of popular culture. And so I think what is so special about the Katitsi series is that they are told through the eyes of the child and they are so loyal to that gaze. And I think that's why children love Katitsi, you know, when I'm out in Sweden meeting people and stuff, I will have these like 40 year old, 45 year old, 50 year old women coming up to me and say, I was, I read Katitsi, you know, it changed my life. I, I identified with Katitsi or I identified with Rosa. And so this has like really touched uh, generations of readers. And I think also, I mean, as we saw in this uh, clip, you know, Katarina didn't avoid uh, difficult issues. She really 
write wrote about them both sort of like as like you know events as incidents but also you could feel what Katitsi feels in that moment where everybody stares at her and the teacher treats her like that so uh, I think that was really the strength of Katitsi and of course they're also not only about these moments uh, where you know they you know are being treated bad or you know when the race is just race and just comes out it's also really about you know Katitsi being such an active child um she's really curious you know she will um not just take an answer from the adults she will question adults you know and so it's a it's a very it's really the whole world of this child I think it's not an it's not an easy achievement to become famous with a children's book in the country of Astrid Lidgren. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, we I think we've reached the limit of our our time, an hour and a half. I would invite Linda and Ursula to come back. Maybe they can share also their fascination with Katitsi. And um, yes. Yeah, they are. Lavin and Radmila, thank you very much for this very interesting introduction to Katarina Taiken and her achievements and her book. It was really thank interesting. Thank you. Thank you a lot. It was, was a pleasure. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Such an informative and inspiring evening. We are very thankful. And um, yeah, everybody. Um, Watch the movie, watch the whole movie. You can watch it until Sunday 6 on the Akidikea website. It's really, yeah, you probably got an impression through the scenes. Read the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also, you can all, yeah, uh, it's um, in English, but yeah, you are all fluent. So thank you very much, uh, Radmila and Lavin. Thank you all audience in the World Wide Web. Yes, and... Um, as allies, we also wanted to say that we are very thankful that you told us the untold story of Katarina and also her sister Rosa. And we will take care of continue talking about her and continue the things she fought for, because I think there's so much more to learn about this feminist icon. And we are very thankful that you shared your expertise and your work and your thoughts and emotions with us. So. I think in the name of the World Wide Web, <laughs> we can say thank you very much. Well, thank you, guys. I also just want to say thanks for this opportunity. And I'm so glad that there's interest, you know, in Katarina and Rosa's life. Uh, also, you know, outside of Sweden, it makes me so happy for these connections because I feel like, you know, once you meet those two sisters, you, you sort of yeah, you're being opened up. And as you said, Radmila, it really gives you inspiration. It lifts you. Well, I, I hope that we have channeled some of the inspiration that's coming from Katarina. And I really hope that, uh, that uh, there are more such films coming. Yes. That would be something that's really needed. And uh, it's not like there are not people to be talked about and presented and... Uh, uh, admired. Yeah. I'm sure there will be more films about other important activists. So now we are already over the time. So thanks a lot. Have a nice evening and see thank you. you guys. See you. Thank you very Ciao. much. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bleiben wir aber noch drin und gehen gleich nochmal, wenn wir raus sind.